This is the Heartland Daily Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. Welcome to what I hope becomes a regular discussion of climate half follow-up for the preceding week from the Heartlands, too. I'm Sterling Burnett, Heartland Senior Fellow and Managing Editor of Environment Climate News. The huge, in many ways misleading, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Assessment Report is still being digested, parsed, analyzed, and almost daily lied about in the mainstream media. What was a steady drip, drip, drip of stories claiming human were causing climate change before the report's release has become a flood of daily stories on radio, in print, and on TV, most of them confusing weather with climate and misleadingly implying that this or that weather event will without climate change. We've covered a few of these stories on climate realism this week, and that's what we're here to discuss. Joining me today in this week's podcast is James Taylor, president of the Heartland Institute, who's been writing about climate change, I have, way back when it was still called global warming. And Anthony Watts, the senior fellow for the environment with the Heartland Institute. James, Anthony, thanks for being here. Great to be here, Sterling. So for the past week, three in the past week, three tropical storms, one of which became a, a category one hurricane, low level hurricane, um, have formed in the Atlantic. And the usual suspects, of course, have blamed this on climate change. Yet I note after a fast start with five storms forming in the early part of the season, the Atlantic went more than a month from July 8th through August 11th without a single tropical storm forming, much less a hurricane. Where were the stories about climate change and hurricanes then? Uh, not existent. The Hurricane Center, National Hurricane Center, is constantly revising its forecast back in December and then again in May. It predicted it would be an extremely busy season. It's now projecting, uh, and of course, I hope correct, fewer named storms, fewer hurricanes, and fewer major hurricanes, of which neither of the two thus far have been. Of course, September is usually peak hurricane season, and we're not there yet. When it picks up, as it usually does in September, I think uh, the stories will be all about climate change again. And it's like when there's a drought, we don't talk about climate change, um, a drought and hurricanes. When a hurricane appears as it's supposed to do in hurricane season, it's all climate change. I think it just goes to show that you can blame everything on climate change. In fact, you can blame this podcast on climate change. <laughs> That's why uh, we're here. Um, but yeah, you know, it's funny. The media jumps in and says, OK, here's a hurricane or here's two hurricanes. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, there were like three or four hurricanes simultaneously in the Atlantic. And they were sh just shouting absolute proof of climate change because there's so many hurricanes in the Atlantic at one moment. But when we don't have any hurricanes, what's that proof of? They never talk about that. But it, it all goes back to the whole thing about modeling the future. And just this past week, we covered on Climate Realism a new story talking about how um, there was some two new studies that came out that said that the models that are predicting the future are overheated and they're not um, they're not accurate. They're overblown. Now, here's the here's the uh, story on climate realism right here. You can go to climaterealism.com and read this story. But basically now we have in the last month three different things, three different peer-reviewed studies saying that the models predicting our climate future are overheated. They are predicting too much warmth and temperature uh, in relation to additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what does that say about the ability for the IPCC and others to predict the future? It says to me that it's greatly in question and it's been overblown. Yeah, and those are great points. Well, it, and it says add. also the, the attribution studies are, are terrible because they want to attribute this overheated climate markings. That's right. And, you know, everything stems from that. Everything stems from these models, whether it's predicting more tornadoes or less tornadoes or more hurricanes or less hurricane, more drought, less drought, more rain, less rain, whatever it might be. It's all predicated on these models. And oftentimes the output of these models is contradictory. 
they don't always agree. And so we're left with a great amount of uncertainty for the future. But politicians and the media seem to have an exact certainty that the future is going to be worse. And therefore, we have to do something about it now. But really, why should we if we don't have a certainty about it? Now, that's my point. There's so little certainty in the future. As you go further out into the future, the, the climate models widen. The, the range of uncertainty increases. And therefore, your uh, ability to predict what you should do or to act on it is greatly diminished. You know, you might do something now thinking it's going to help the future, and it ends up not doing so. And, and that's the real risk okay. in taking, taking action now. James, so, you wanted to say something, James. Yeah, yeah. Focusing on the hurricane question, as somebody who has lived almost all of his adult life in Florida, there, there are a few observations here that I have. Uh, Florida recently went through its longest period in recorded history without a hurricane strike, and the media didn't report that. I mean, that, that was wonderful news. Uh, also, the United States as a whole recently went through far and away its longest period in history without a major hurricane strike anywhere. And again, the media didn't report that. And, and I used to say uh, in, in, in articles that I would write that, hey, as soon as we get a major hurricane strike or as soon as a hurricane strikes Florida, all of a sudden they're going to blame global warming. And sure enough, back a few years ago, I think it was 2017 when the streak was finally broken, a major hurricane hit the Florida panhandle. And I had some scientist, some climate scientist, she made sure to tell me over and over again with the Weather Channel that took me on a tour of where the hurricane hit and said, still don't believe in climate change? <laughs> like, okay, we finally got a major hurricane. They happen all the time. But as far as the uh, the storms that we have this year, what's very noteworthy is the the first storm that we had in the Gulf and that came up, uh, went up along the west coast of Florida. Uh, that was a storm that stayed a tropical storm. And the media said, oh, we have it. This is an early storm and it shows the horrors of global warming. Well, actually, in Florida, rain is welcomed. Uh, tropical storms, tropical depressions, even category one hurricanes do a tremendous amount of good for providing water for the region that's necessary. It's when you have the real major hurricanes that you have a big problem. And, and even even the smaller storms will cause some problems. But nevertheless, it's what the region is used, used to. It's what the plants uh, are used to. And so we saw the first storm stayed a tropical storm. Now we have a few other ones that are again staying tropical storms, may become a category one hurricane. And here we are in late August. Um, this is supposed to be the peak of hurricane season and essentially we've had very little. Um, so if and when any of these storms or storms later in the, in the season develop into a significant hurricane, the media is going to blame global warming as if hurricanes never formed before there was global warming. But the reality is that we don't see any intensification. And that's shown in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration data. It's admitted in the United Nations climate reports. So just saying that anything that happens is caused by global warming makes no sense when the objective data shows no worsening trends whatsoever. Uh, that's exactly right, James. You know, you and I have both written about this multiple times. Um, but leaving hurricanes for a moment and going back to what Anthony said, models. So Anthony made the point that the farther out the models go, the wider the range of, uh, you know, possible outcome, possible outcomes. That's true across the board for any modeling. Economic models can predict five years in the future and in 10 years, they become worse at predicting things the farther out the prediction goes. Weather models, typical, you know, daily weather models, what you get your you get your weather report every now in the news. They report what's going on tomorrow and what you can expect. You know, some of them go the two-week forecast. But the farther out they predict, the more likely the forecast is going to be wrong. I mean, they can even be wrong from day to day, and yet. Climate models, which are uh, more complicated versions of weather models, uh, and complexity doesn't add, uh, doesn't make these things better, uh, are supposed to be predicting things that happen uh, 80 and 100 years and more. It's crazy. I would like to point out that models are useful. There are plenty of, of applications where models are useful. In aerodynamics, in bridge building, mechanics, things of this nature, where you have known physical processes and not a lot of chaotic uh, 
you know, things like, you know, atmospheric mixing and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to doing modeling of physical things and getting the outcome, models do pretty well. So we're not dissing models in general. All we're saying is that because climate models are so incredibly complex, just like the climate system itself, there's so many variables, there's so much entropy, there's so much chaos that they can't accurately produce an outcome because they're not sophisticated enough for the job. Yeah, and, and the further you go out predicting anything, and of course with global warming and, and impacts, um, it, it's harder because there are so many components. But I mean, look, just a month or two ago, we had the experts predicting the stability of Afghanistan. Uh, look what happened. <laughs> the further out you go, in that case, a month or two, and these are the experts. You know, these are the yeah. Biden administration's military uh, experts. Do we, we want to start had- a pool? Do we want to start a pool mm. on when uh, the media will blame the whole Afghanistan debacle on climate change? Well, I'm, Anthony, afraid, I'm afraid it's already happened. We'll get yeah, to that. In a- yeah. you're, you're behind well, the times uh, because just, just an hour ago, CBS News published an article saying that global warming is to blame. And I will be destroying that later today on the Climate Realism <laughs> website because it is farcical. But yes, uh, when, when the models yeah. fail, blame global warming. Wait, I think we, we are better at predicting uh, what we, the media is going to do than the models are. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. The, the media is fairly easy to predict. Uh, you find out what's going to be a disaster and that what what estimates will be a disaster. And that's what you'll see in the news uh of the moment and the next day. So, James, uh, <laughs> the one of the most enjoyable stories you produced for climate realism this week, at uh, least, uh, was when you started out the week with a report about an editor of the LA Times where he was crowing, and I quote him, since the IPCC report was released Monday, letters denying the science still trickle in. But this isn't anything like 2013. Uh, he titled the article, Where Have All the Climate Change Deniers Gone? Now, as you noted on Climate Realism, Paul Thornton, the letters to the editor editor who uh, who wrote the column, was being highly cri- hypocritical. Why so? <laughs> well, as you mentioned, the most enjoyable articles, um, they're not enjoyable to to see the garbage that's going on. Um, I, I, I do admit, and, and folks in the Heartland office here can attest that they will often hear me laughing out loud all of a sudden abruptly when I'm reading some of this stuff, uh, just in, in exasperation, you gotta be kidding me. Um, so writing it, uh, exposing their hypocrisy and, and, and their misinformation can be somewhat enjoyable. I just wish I didn't have to. But essentially what happened is the LA Times back in 2013, uh, Paul Thornton, the guy who wrote this article, crowing, mocking and chiding climate realists for being fewer in number and being marginalized as evidenced by the fact that there were few letters to the editor to the LA Times from climate realists this past week about the UN's climate report. He says, ah, ha ha, I'm not getting nearly as many as I used to back in 2013 and 2014. This shows that you guys are, you guys are irrelevant. Well, in 2013, the LA Times and Paul Thornton himself was the author of this, published an article stating, we are no longer going to cover both sides of this issue. You can write your letters to the LA Times, but we're not going to publish any of them. We're, we're going to ban you. You're blocked. You're censored forever. So then, I mean, rationally, I mean, believe it or not, people who are climate realists tend to be rational and intelligent. Rational, intelligent people don't write letters to the editor for newspapers that say up front they're not going to publish them. We have better things to do. So, uh, But this is the type of, again, the, the lies and misinformation that the climate alarmist community engages in. So here, and and by the way, Google News promoted that Paul Thornton article at the very top of its news searches for climate crisis and climate change. So if anybody's looking at it, they'll read that article and they'll say, aha, yes. Oh, well, see, now even Republicans and conservatives need to get on board for climate action because there's no base anymore. See, this proves it. Nobody's sending in letters anymore. And yet it's. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, the implication being that uh, they've either been counted into silent, they've gone to the other side, they've suddenly become uh, climate. Uh, alarmists themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so, the definition but, of misinformation and, coming from Paul exactly. Thornton in the LA Times. Well, we perhaps, tell you in advance we won't publish your work, and then you crow about the fact that, oh, no one's sending me this, your, your work anymore. Perhaps some of our, our watchers and listeners on this podcast can take up the torch now and write a few letters to the LA Times citing what we've just talked about and flood him with a few new articles so he's happy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I myself uh, suggest they actually look up the LA Times phone number and just start flooding their uh, 
their uh, telephone board. Here you go. So, you asked for it. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, climate alarmist, James. <laughs> it, just in the past week, let's talk about some of the things they've done. They blamed North Korea's lack of development and problems. They blamed Africa's lack of development and problems. And today uh, they blamed, uh, an hour ago, they blamed the Taliban's success all on climate change. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, as you said, it's maddening, it's discouraging, and it's, uh, you know, funny in a not haha, but ironic sort of way. Do you think there might be another more obvious culprit, James? Like, I don't know, dictatorments, communist economic yeah. systems and shoddy property rights, for example, to, to right. explain why they have no food, why they are poor. Right. So so let's start with North Korea. And then I'm going to transition to another one that you didn't mention, but we posted it just about half an hour ago. I posted it regarding African nations. But basically, uh, there was an article, again, heavily promoted uh, by Google News, and this was published by Newsweek, in which you had two American climate activists for climate activist organization. They published an article titled How the Climate Crisis Could Further Destabilize North Korea, like, like as if that's a bad thing. We, we, wanna, we want North Korea to be successful at what they do. But anyway, the notion was, and, and let me read this, the quote here, at present, North Korea is facing a food crisis so severe that the government has been forced to release army rations. A perfect storm of back-to-back -back typhoons last fall, perfect drought, persistent drought this spring, an ongoing summer heat wave, and recent heavy rains have led to the current state of severe food insecurity, even prompting the Kim regime to issue a rare famine warning this spring. Now, I'm going to break that all down very quickly, but he, he, here's what happened. Back last fall, there was a very minimal Category 1 hurricane that came ashore in North Korea and almost immediately dissipated. That was back in August, a year ago. A month later, a tropical storm, not a hurricane, not a typhoon, as they say, again, came ashore in North Korea and immediately dissipated. Those two events brought needed moisture to North Korea. Even if there were some negative impact on crops, uh, that was a year ago. That doesn't impact after a fall, a winter, and then, an and then finally the melting of snow and ice in spring, the planting of crops this year. To blame a food crisis on global warming that clearly has everything to do with tyranny, with political repression, with Marxism, with, with the socialism that they wish to impose on the United States is absolutely disingenuous. And we know this because the crop data in South Korea at the very same time shows persistent increases in crop production, records being set almost every year, including now, including this year. And, and the, United, uh, the, the United Nations reports that for the world as a whole, we see increases in crop production. So on climate realism, I documented how the Korean crop production numbers suck, for lack of a better word. And everywhere else in the world, including South Korea, which shares the same peninsula, it doesn't. So the answer is not global warming, as these Marxist sympathizers would want us James, to believe. That's it's not fair. Militarianism. That's not fair. Climate change recognizes the demilitarized zone and doesn't affect people south of the uh, demilitarized zone. It, <laughs> but it, it, it stops it's right become, there. Climate change has become essentially the universal boogeyman. I mean, it gets blamed for everything, whether it's, you know, crops, uh, more rain, lack of rain, whatever. It's just like the universal go-to now because, well, you know, the science proves it, right? You know, they think that that is the universal go-to for any kind of abnormal bit of weather or famine or drought or whatever. And, and no one really ever checks the media on this. The media themselves don't check it. Uh, and in fact, one of the biggest problems with the media is that the majority of journalists are almost completely science illiterate. There's very few science journalists out there. And, and many that are uh, science journalists that are literate are fully engaged in the idea that the future is going to be grim. And they go also immediately into the go-to of climate change to blame everything on it without really looking at the data. What's so amazing to me about all of this is that if you just scratch the surface just a little bit of a lot of these stories, and go look at some data, like from what James showed with the FAO, the the, uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. You look at their data for crops, boom, where's the crisis? It's not there. It's not supported in the data. Well, well, here's the thing. It's not just scientific illiteracy. 
Um, it's it's deliberately fact checking what you want to fact check and not fact checking what you don't want to fact check. That's so right. if we were to publish an article about North Korean crop production, any well, first of all, they never cover it. But if they ever did, they would immediately go to the climate alarmist community and try and get everything possible quotes to to take it apart. But they don't do that for this article. These these writers for Newsweek, because they want to be able to say that it's not Marxism. It's not totalitarianism from the left. It is instead global warming. And in addition to the crop data, I mean, this information is not hard to find, even if you are scientifically illiterate. A quick internet search pulled up the temperatures in North Korea for this spring and summer, which they say were excessively hot. No, they weren't. June was precisely average. July was a little warmer than average, but nothing exceptional. Also, precipitation, precipitation data shows that throughout North Korea, it's been pretty much an average year almost throughout the entire country. A few uh, areas are a little wetter than average, a few a little drier. But they simply make this stuff up because yeah. they want to be able to say that it's not leftist Marxist totalitarianism, it's global warming. And I, I encourage you to go to climaterealism.com and read the article because and when it's again, you have the left shilling for communist dictatorships and blaming global warming. And when it's not uh, communist totalitarian dictatorships, in the African article you just you describe, it's uh, it's tin pot dictators uh, that don't have any, I think, political ideology at all, except for amassing themselves power and and uh, robbing their country blind. Yeah, yeah, plus that a lot of times these these dictators, if if aid is sent to these places, they gobble it up. They put it out on the black market and the, it never actually ends up in the hands of people that need it. Yeah. Right. So yesterday the UN published a paper. It's called Five Things You Need to Know About the Climate Emergency in West and Central Africa. And they make five arguments asserting that it's not because Africa is run overwhelmingly by dictators that the people suffer, but saying that global warming is causing all these problems. And when you look at the specific assertions and they name specific nations and regions, and they make specific claims about droughts and floods and crop failures. But again, just like with North Korea, the information's available, it's objective, it's irrefutable, and it absolutely destroys this assertion by the United Nations. What we see objectively by the United Nations own crop data that they report, is that crop production throughout Africa, and especially in the Sahel region, which they say is the worst hit, is in long-term improvement. It's setting new records every year. If you have uh, a climate situation where you have more abundant rainfall, a greening of the earth and a greening of Africa, and you have more abundant uh, precipitation crop production and this greening, and yet the people are still starving, the answer is not global warming. The answer is you have dictators that are running the countries, but yeah. the United, United Nations wants to give cover to these dictators and these idiotic Western media, or you can say they're not idiotic, they're just agenda driven and intelligent, nevertheless gives coverage for this and makes this the biggest story so that the world now feels like, oh, we're so bad here in the United States, we're causing all this, all this uh, misery on these poor people in Africa who are already the most vulnerable. Boy, we better do something to harm our own economy to help them out when it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in particular, I looked at uh, earlier this week, I looked at Nigeria because there were some articles specifically on Nigeria. And they said, oh, people are suffering uh, uh, from crop uh, decline, that there's f food insecurity is increasing in Nigeria. And I said, well, gosh, that's got to be a sign of, uh, you know, they, they said that's, that's because of global warming. And well, to, if it's caused by global warming, it's because crops are failing. Uh, it turns out that every major crop they had has increased more than 300 percent since James Hansen first declared climate. You know, humans were causing dangerous global warming. Yeah. Uh, one, like a, a couple of them went up 400 percent. Uh, one of them went up 400 percent. One of them three, went up 300 uh, percent. All these crops that they grow are going up. Now, I can't speak. I'm not on the ground. I can't speak to whether the in food insecurity is increasing. But if food insecurity is increasing while crop production is going up and because I also looked at the economic data because they said, oh, the economy is, uh, you know, in terrible shape. Uh, I looked at their economic data. Well, their economy goes up and down. It's crazy. Um, but uh, 13 years since the year 2000, their economy grew annually higher than four, 5 percent. That's pretty good growth. In one year, they grew 15 percent. Uh, 
they've only had one year of negative economic growth, not counting 2020's downturn because of COVID. And so if your economy is improving, your GDP is going up, your crops are improving. If there's food insecurity, it doesn't have to do with climate. It has to do with politics. Something's going on there. You know, if you listen to the climate alarmist, it seems that the greatest export product the United States has is misery. <laughs> you know, it's like they, they just simply latch onto that. It's, it's, it's like uh, they can't see the benefits that we've had over the past century. Yes, it's gotten warmer over the past century around the world. No denying that whatsoever. The data is clear on that. However, the idea is that somehow this is a bad thing. But what's happened during that time, crop yields have increased globally. We've had, uh, a, we've had a tremendous increase in world economy growth. Uh, prosperity has grown. Health has improved dramatically. Um, we have all of these things that have happened. Plus, in the middle of all of this, satellites from NASA have determined that over the last 30 years, because of the additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the Earth has actually gotten greener. There's a, a surface area approximately equal to the surface area of the United States spread around the world that has gotten greener than it used to be. And so, you know, why is that a bad thing? We don't hear about this stuff because it seems that all they can talk about is misery or potential misery from climate change. It's really, you know, it's a one trick pony kind of an argument. Let's, yeah. um, and yeah, and, and just segueing into a, a few other climate realism articles uh, that we published this week. When you mentioned about the greening of the earth and we've mentioned the improving crop production in Nigeria. Uh, and, and throughout Africa as well. Yeah. So we had a few articles here in which, again, I, just, I laugh out loud, so loud that the, I startle the entire office when I read the, uh, the articles. Uh, in the mainstream media, promoted heavily by Google News at the very top of their search results, there were assertions that global warming is destroying almond production, mm -hmm. global warming is destroying coffee beans and making our coffee taste worse, Global warming is making uh, it, it more difficult to make sushi because of fish and rice shortages. And basically what they do is, is the alarmists look for, I, they say, okay, what do people like? Well, let's go now and find, and, and, and we'll just make up, we'll just make crap up if we need to, uh, in order to we'll make up a story saying that global warming is making it worse. And in each of these instances, coffee beans, especially the Arabica coffee beans that are the most tasty, uh, almond production in California, rice and fish production for sushi, what we see with the objective data is that as the earth modestly warms, each of these commodities are becoming easier to produce. They're becoming more abundant. And yet you have these media articles that just make a conclusory statement that says, well, you know, farmers are stressed out by whatever it may be. If there was a drought or a flood or something that happened, which of course has always happened at some time in some place. Now they say, well, that means uh, you know, now we're no longer gonna have Arabica coffee beans. And yet by the objective data, uh, Arabica coffee beans are increasing in production. So anyway, at almonds are increasing. Almonds. go every day and, and you'll see our, our debunking yeah. of this garbage yeah. in the media. You, you showed it. Almonds are increasing. Rice is increasing. The fish for sushi has increased. And, and you know, let's talk about taste for a second. Um, <laughs> coffee taste is somewhat objective. Uh, I drank it when I was a young man and drank it for its... Uh, energizing attributes, not because I thought it tasted great. Um, but I've, I, I can only speak for myself, but I've got more variety and flavors now than I've ever had in my coffee shop. It tastes better today than it's ever tasted. So I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, moving on to another topic you took on this week, James. Um, if alarmists are to be believed, climate change is also causing uh, workplace health problems. It's killing people on the job. Uh, yet the data, and once again, we should always go back to the data when you hear these claims, consistently show a decline in deaths associated with temperatures as the earth has modestly warmed. What's going on? Yeah. So the Union of Concerned Scientists, and by the way, uh, yeah. if you are a, a remotely objective member of the media, and you see an article from the Union of Concerned Scientists, then, then you have to know bells are going off. This is an agenda-driven organization. Even if, even if we're going to follow its, its papers and, and, and decide we might want to address it, you might want to ask somebody who's not an activist 
like the Union of Concerned Scientists, what's really going on. Well, let's be You might mention, I want to mention about the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, Back in 2011, you know, they don't care who's a member as long as you send money. And I proved this. I enrolled my dog, Kenji, and he became an official member of the Union of Concerned Scientists. All they needed was a credit card. They cared about nothing else. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you, you, you become a concerned scientist when you send them, I think, uh, the last time I checked, it was 25 bucks. It's probably yeah. You too can now. be a concerned but, scientist, yeah, only yeah, $29.95. Exactly. And an expert. So they published a paper this week. It's titled Too Hot to Work. And the paper's message is that global warming is increasing the number of very hot days, which has two very important negative impacts. First of all, this makes it... Uh, that this reduces the number of days that construction workers and other outdoor workers can be outside working. So it's harming our pocketbooks, it's harming our economy, and it's harming outdoor workers who are disproportionately black and Latino. And therefore, you know, we're, we're making the most vulnerable members of our society even more economic destitute. The second argument they made is that more uh, there will be more deaths because some people have to go out and work. And with global warming, you're having more heat caused deaths. So there's literally blood on our hands uh, due to global warming. But what the paper did not report, of course, there's a flip side to this. If you're increasing the number of, of very warm days and the planet is warming and even the United Nations acknowledges that there is a significantly fewer number of very cold days, one, you are increasing the number of days during the cold season that people can be outside working and making money and feeding their families. And two, that you are reducing the number of cold cause deaths. And interestingly enough, and, and the timing is just right, uh, just last month, a peer reviewed study in the prestigious medical journal Lancet found that 10 times more people die from heat than from cold. And Moreover, it found that going back to the year 2000, so 20 years worth of data, they explicitly found that the modest warming that has occurred has saved a net of 3 million lives worldwide. They documented that less than, uh, it's only a, a few hundred thousand people, they, they figured died from excessive heat that's been caused by global warming, but nearly 4 million people have had their lives saved by this. So that's something that the UCS, Union of Concerned Art- uh, Scientists article, never mentioned. Google, Google News and the other media that reported on it never mentioned it. But the fact of the matter is global warming is saving lives and especially for outdoor workers. No, in fact, what Google News and the other uh, headline making media sources said, they said, these were the headlines because I report on this, uh, 5 million deaths caused by climate change. Five million deaths caused by temperatures. Well, uh, climate change, no. Temperatures. Yeah, caused by extreme climate. Yeah. Tem- Not temper- mentioning temperatures that- affecting, but what they don't show is that the vast majority of those deaths were caused by cold. And of course, you know, you talk, you talk about, I, I don't go down a street. I don't go down any street in uh, North Texas. I wish I did, believe me. Uh, that it doesn't have construction going on actively during the summer. You know when that construction stops largely during the winter, and I bet it's even worse in Minnesota, in uh, in Wisconsin, in North Dakota. I, I bet you know if the guys there are out there in their orange vest and and caps, um, that's a struggle. And if that's declining for them, they're getting more work days, not less. No, it's it's the misinformation. Uh, that and outright lies that they publish each and every day. And but that's what they have to do to stoke the asserted climate crisis upon which their jobs, their funding and everything else depends. Before we close, um, I'd like to move on from the science a bit, because we don't just cover science on climate realism, though that's primarily. We also cover the politics and the economics. And um, a number of stories uh, reappeared this week showing more, saying, not showing, but saying more and more Republicans were were shifting on climate change from being climate realist to embracing climate alarm. They're pushing bills to limit fossil fuel. You know, what are your thoughts on these claims and stories, James? Because I know you've written about this in the past. Right. Yeah. Well, and I saw this article in the New York Times and uh, the title is Amid Extreme Weather, A Shift in Republicans on Climate Change. So what they're trying to tell you in the headline is because 
the negative impacts of global global warming are so overwhelming, undeniable, visible, and they're getting worse that Republicans are shifting and now they're supporting action. To support this, they reference Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham, who have always <laughs> been calling for climate action. They have always been representing the left of the Republican Party. And this is the misinformation that they've been reporting, they being the media and climate activists, ever since I joined Heartland in 2001, that now even Republicans, even conservatives are saying this now. Well, it's 20 years later, and basically all you can cite are Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham. But also, yeah, I mean, for, them, for them to have shifted, they'd have shift. to become, yeah, for them to have shifted, they'd have to have become climate realist. Right. But also one shifted. thing that... One thing that's worth that's worth reporting and, and understanding is uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council. This is an organization of state legislators who are closer to the grassroots, who need to be in touch with their glass, grassroots base if they're going to uh, represent them effectively and, and be up for re-election. Uh, ALEC, the acronym for the American Legislative Exchange Council, they believe their their mission statement is to promote free markets, individual liberty, and federalism. So these are these are the legislators, the policymakers that the New York Times claims are becoming more activist and shifting on climate change. Well, just last month, ALEC had its annual meeting and we at the Heartland Institute uh, worked with uh, some legislators uh, proposing a resolution that stated unequivocally that there are no circumstances in which any government action to reduce restrict or disincentivize conventional energy and carbon dioxide emissions, there are no circumstances in which that would be a good thing. And when put to a vote, the vote was, it didn't just pass, it passed unanimously. So when the New York Times wants to cite Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham and say that this is Republican shifting, um, yeah, it's two Republicans that don't need to shift because they're already there. The proof is in the pudding. Conservative legislators who are close to their, to their grassroots base know better and vote accordingly. Yeah, and again, it goes back to the data. The voting data shows there's no shift. Yeah, no, poll, polling data consistently shows there's there's very little change. Um, so, guys, what are we to make of the media's obsession with the so-called climate crisis? And what can our listeners do to tune out the noise or static and find the truth? Because, look, we do our work. You... you the three of us and, and, and others of our uh, friends and allies, we do our work, but there's a never ending drum beat and it gets louder by the day that humans are causing a climate crisis. You know, why, why is the media obsessed with this and what can we do to, to set our, our listeners on the path to the truth? Well, I think the best thing that people can do who are concerned about this and realize that a lot of this is overblown is do three things write to your elected representatives and tell them this isn't supported by data. That's number one. Number two, write to your local newspaper. Put a letter to the editor in the newspaper. Yes, you'll probably get some people that'll blow back at you, but it's the usual tired arguments that with no substance, they really won't be able to refute any data that you cite, especially if you get it from climaterealism.com. And then thirdly, when you go to online forums and so forth, leave comments and direct people to look at the real world data instead of just talking about the impending disasters that are being pushed by the media. Those are the things that we can do to make a difference. Yeah. And I would say as far as uh, the two factors uh, influencing the media coverage of this, number one, uh, the media is far to the left, even of, of Joe Biden. Um, they would they would push the party at least as far left as AOC and maybe farther. So, of course, the, the climate activism of the uh, of the climate left is something that they're going to cheer on, regardless of what the facts are. And secondly, uh, even for those few that uh, do not wish a, a Nicolas Maduro uh, rule here in the United States, still sensationalism sells stories and gets clicks and views. So if you report something about how we're having a, another climate crisis and it's destroying your coffee, that's going to get more clicks than a story that says, hey, coffee production is doing well. OK, as far as what you can do, I, I, I recommend two things. We have two websites here at the Heartland Institute that we launched a year and a half ago uh, that are must uh, must see, uh, must rely upon resources, especially for policymakers, but really for everyone else, so that you can uh, en engage knowledgeably with people claiming a, cr a climate crisis. First, climateataglance.com. We provide summaries 
of 40 plus topics that are typically frequently discussed regarding global warming, hurricanes, droughts, tornadoes. They're just a page or two. They're, they have a few bullet points at the top, a short summary and a compelling graphic. So you don't have to get over your head in, in, in scientific wonkies, but you have the essential data that tells you what is really going on. So you are armed to debate any issue uh, regarding global warming. Second, we've mentioned here in, in today's uh, 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 video cast, climaterealism.com frequently. Every day, Sterling, Anthony and I, we go and do Google News searches for climate change and we see what the media is trying to promote. Uh, we're also looking at the major uh, networks and that's what people are going to be talking about on a given day. That's where they're gonna try and get you with the gotcha questions. Well, what about this? Still don't believe in climate change? Go to climaterealism.com and, and we present the truth about these media, you know, these media prominent stories that are presented every day. And again, you'll know exactly what the truth is. And therefore you can, you can spread the truth to your friends, to your neighbors, writing letters to the editor, as Anthony says. I, I think that from the grassroots up, truth is irrepressible, even by politicians and the media. Yeah, we, you, on climate realism, we either uh, address the climate du jour, the climate crisis du jour in the news by responding with data and facts, or, uh, you know, sometimes we promote when on those few occasions when it happens, when when the truth leaks through and, and a newspaper publishes an article that displays the truth. We also promote that. And we say, look, here's here's someone that got it right. And uh, you should pay attention. Well, it's been another great discussion. I look forward to taking it up again soon. In the meantime, I encourage our audience, as as James has done, go to Heartland's various websites, which include climaterealism.com climateataglance.com. He didn't mention this one, but uh, one of my personal favorites, since I'm the managing editor of it, Climate Change Weekly, uh, where we publish summaries of the most recent research uh, every week. Uh, Environment and Climate News, which tracks more than just climate issues, but the energy and environmental laws and regulations that affect everyone. In addition, I encourage everyone to go to Heartland's website and find out how you can help support our mission of promoting sound science, limited government, free markets, and individual liberty. Take care. Bye.